Okay, so I think we'll get started. Uh, I'm David Siegel. I run the organization Demand Progress and helped organize this today. Thanks so much for coming, and thanks to Chewy Garcia's office and the CPC for helping host this. Um, so as, as you all know, last month, the newly minted Libra Association released a white paper about its ostensible effort to, quote, enable a simple global currency and financial infrastructure that empowers billions of people. We'll be discussing the ways in which this effort, in fact, threatens national sovereignty, foments systemic risk, and exploits public service failures that could be corrected for. Um, so as to mystify the public and obscure Facebook's substantial control over the project, Libra is to be launched on a small and anything but permissionless blockchain with on the order of dozens of nodes, generally run by multinational corporations with hundreds of millions of dollars at hand. It'll be backed by, quote, a basket of fiat currency and other assets. Uh, investing corporations will profit off of interest on those reserves, which will be vulnerable to hacking or to declines in the values of the assets they comprise. The Libra payment network will be accessible through digital wallets that are integrated with Facebook's social media services, thus likely advantaging Facebook directly through access to data about those who are using the service uh, increases in the value of ads and more. And in a striking display of hubris and disrespect for the intelligence of the public and policymakers like yourselves, this consortium of multinational corporations in furtherance of a private governance project that will increase their political and economic power at the expense of national sovereignty and the integrity of public regulatory regimes makes the unironic claim that it is guided by the notion that, quote, a global currency and financial infrastructure should be designed and governed as a public good. In contrast, to those, in contrast, those on the panel today actually believe the governance of payment systems should be vested in the public domain, and we'll speak to the ways in which Libra is at tension with this, uh, to the domestic regulatory and oversight lenses through which it will be, or at least should be, vetted, and the ways in which its already flimsy claims to a public-facing value proposition would be undermined by provision of certain public services that are within our reach. So I'll do intros of the panelists. They'll each speak for five minutes or so, um, and then we'll do questions, I think, probably exclusively from the audience, since uh, at the vast majority of your staffers who have questions that we'd like to answer. So with us today in speaking order are Rohan Gray, who's a doctoral student at Cornell and founder and president of the Modern Money Network, uh, Heather Slavkin Corso, who's a senior fellow at Americans for Financial Reform, Porter McConnell, who's campaign director at Take on Wall Street, and Matt Stoller, who's a fellow at the Open Markets Institute and the author of the forthcoming book, Goliath, The Hundred-Year War Between Monopoly Power and Populism. And with that, I'll hand it off to Rohan. Thanks. So if you had started this story by looking at private cryptocurrencies and blockchains and you saw the word blockchain in Facebook's um, prospectus, you'd think that this was an attempt to ge generate a genuinely private currency um, or something that is open and decentralized. Ultimately, this is, at least in its initial iteration, a closed permission system built around a single data structure instead of a chain uh, of blocks where uh, any entity can contribute uh, the proof of work. Uh, it claims to be its own currency, but it's ultimately going to be backed by government-issued or government-backed assets, um, and it's going to have uh, a range of local price exchange rates that are going to be maintained by that uh, currency system from day one. So if you actually look at what it is, it's not actually a currency at its outset. It's an ecosystem. The ecosystem has a non-profit foundation with a number of actors that are corporate entities at the outset. No entity with a one-person, one-vote rule. Uh, it's going to be a database uh, and then a currency that is backed up by a network of authorized resellers that function like a dealer system to make markets to buy and sell Libra into other assets. That uh, network is going to be underscored ultimately by a buyer of last resort called Libra Reserve. And then on top of that system, a number of entities are going to be able to um, create new products and, and platforms and trading uh, activities uh, through API layers, etc. cetera. Um, what you end up seeing from this is that the ecosystem resembles the way a government currency ecosystem is built with a number of institutions and overlapping uh, components, but in this context, the entire ecosystem is built itself on top of government currencies. So it doesn't have its own legal system, it doesn't have its own enforcement system, it doesn't have its own underlying proposition for the value of currency. When it gets to that very core question, it punts the, the answer back to national currencies without any accountability to those countries for what its actions may do for the value of that currency. 
So why a public digital system might be superior to this, first of all, Libra has no way of ensuring the safety of its assets. One of the long-standing histories you learn in banking history is that private actors create assets that give the appearance of greater safety than they actually have. That's because the way that contracts works, that's because of the way that risk assessment in competitive markets works. Ultimately, the entity is trying to give the perception that there is going to be less volatility in the value of the asset than is likely to come up in the event of a systemic crisis. There is no guarantee in the Libra system, for example, that resellers will stay in the system the way that primary dealers are required under their counterparty agreement to stay in the treasury markets. There's no reliance that the foreign exchange values of these currencies are going to be stable enough for individuals not to lose their savings or be unable to purchase things in their local countries. And we've seen this before. We've seen it with banks before the advent of deposit insurance and central banks. We've seen it with shadow banks before 2008 and the development of macro prudential regulatory frameworks that incorporated a much wider range of systemically important financial institutions. And we've seen it with other forms of private uh, digital currencies, most notably uh, things like the Mt. Gox Bitcoin Traded Fund, which was claiming to offer deposits in a safe, backed way until ultimately that was revealed to be false. Um, it's noticeable in the last five years that a lot of the energy in this space, a lot of the investor money, has shifted from genuinely private floating currencies towards and to things like stable coins, the goal of which is to punt the question of monetary value back to public authorities and offer this simply as a technical payments layer on top. But Facebook is going one level back again, more ambitious. And it looks ultimately like what a sovereign drawing right would look like if you subtracted the democracy and added an incoherent theory of monetary value on top. And it's notable that the Bank of International Settlements, probably the most sophisticated financial uh, conglomerate in the world, recently released its annual report with a whole chapter devoted to the entrance of fintech uh, or tech companies into the financial services industry. And their uh, prognosis is quite skeptical and um, concerned. So one of the issues here is that uh, money transmitter licenses that Collabra and other entities that would be members of this system uh, want to, would be obtaining don't allow those entities to invest in securities. Yet this act, uh, yet the Facebook ecosystem's value is not going to be only based around hold currency holdings at central banks, but also uh, safe government securities from a range of countries that the Facebook ecosystem gets to choose, and even bank deposits in those countries, therefore exposing it to the risk of individual national financial um, systems. The issue with uh, those interest-earning securities is that the safe assets around the world right now are largely earning zero or negative interest, which brings up a whole range of issues for how those assets can, can be a, a source of profits for the Facebook ecosystem to continue to fund it. Moreover, the idea that high value government security is a sufficiently liquid is something that entities like long-term capital management showed to be false. And also the most recent financial crisis showed that when you have a large demand for those safe assets and no way to guarantee the supply, you can actually generate increased systemic risk around the entire financial system. So even in the most ideal situation, even if you believed all of the Facebook propaganda, the question still remains is, if we had a sufficiently robust public digital ecosystem, what role would there be left for an, act, an entity like Facebook? And that's the question that hasn't really been answered here. You have issues to do with foreign exchange um, setups, the way that swap lines have been designed by countries with treaties that would be essentially competing or undermined by the way that Facebook is trying to take responsibility for international financial uh, FX management. And ultimately, when Facebook talks about cash, it's not offering a cash product. It's offering a deposit where you have a liability that another entity has to maintain its value on your behalf. If we're seriously considering the importance of privacy as we develop this digital financial infrastructure, we need to think about what anonymous cash works for individuals today and what an anonymous cash-like instrument might work for individuals to preserve their privacy, even as we have the kind of uh, oversight and transparency necessary for larger actors and, and corporate entities. Um, so ultimately, this is a question of sovereignty. This is a question of what the division between public infrastructure and private goods are. And until we have a theory of, of an affirmative vision of what we want from our public currency system, Facebook will continue to fill up the breach and the gap with its own vision. So the question for us, I think, is to come up with that vision and articulate it very strongly in the limited time before it's too late.
Thanks, Rohan. So in addition to all of those critical questions about sovereignty that Rohan raised, I think there are a lot of questions about the financial regulatory framework as it applies to Facebook. Um, to be clear, at the outset, I don't have a, a firm view at this point about exactly what financial regulatory framework should apply to Facebook, because I don't think we have enough information right now about what it actually is. So what I will do uh, during my time is talk about um, a few of the leading theories about the appropriate regulation for Facebook based or for Libra based on what we know right now. And um, also, before I get into this, I just want to say I think it's critical that. We, we think of what's happening right now, what Facebook is proposing to do in terms of the economic fundamentals of the products that they are offering to provide and services that they're offering to provide to the clients and the end users. Um, we have to strip away all of the complicated lingo and jargon that goes along with the technology and the innovation and think about what's actually happening here. We actually saw uh, the president last week start to opine himself on what's actually happening here, and he suggested that Facebook uh, Libra should be regulated as a bank. I think if we think about it, we don't need a lot of technical legal analysis to think about what a bank does. Most of us interact with banks day to day, and we know that what we're doing is we're making deposits into accounts and we're making payments based on the de deposits in those accounts. And that is exactly what uh, the Calibra, the Libra wallet, is proposing to, to do. And so I think we need to think very seriously about whether we want an unregulated entity to be providing these really essential storage services for our val assets of value and the payment services that we rely on to execute our day-to-day -day transactions that are essential for our lives. This is um, a service that is not going to be, as it's currently been discussed, regulated by the financial markets regulators that are essential to protect consumers and to protect and prevent systemic risk, as Rohan was discussing. Now, what are we talking about when we talk about systemic risk? What does that mean? What we're talking about is the, the reality that when you have a lot of people who, are, who have assets that are being held within an institution, uh, there's a possibility that they could lose confidence in the stability of that institution. And then if everybody decides, or a lot of people, or too many people, decide at the same time that they want to go to that institution and get whatever asset of value they have back, then the institution holding those assets is going to be forced to liquidate those assets so that they can give the customer the cash that is represented by the assets they're holding. Um, that means that Facebook in this situation, Libra, will be forced to sell all of these assets or is likely to be forced to sell all of these assets at the same time. For all of us who took Economics 101, we know that um, when the supply of assets that's available for sale exceeds the demand, that causes price drops. So it can cause a, a spiral, a, a negative spiral in downward uh, pricing for those assets. In this case, we're talking about government securities in major economies. So the US, the UK, the EU, and Japan. It's possible that if there were a run on the bank at Libra, you could cause a cascading downward impact on the, the prices of those underlying assets, the currencies of core, US, or core global economies. So this is something that our financial markets regulators, we've heard both in the US and around the world, raising a lot of concerns about. So I think we need to get a better understanding of whether Facebook or Libra is going to operate as a bank. And if so, we need to make sure that we're regulating it as such so that we don't create this likelihood of, or this possibility of Libra being at the center of a systemic global financial crisis. Another major argument that we've heard folks talk about in terms of regulation of this is whether it, the Libra may be an ETF, an exchange traded fund. So what that is, is it's a basket of different types of investments that are pooled together into a single entity, and then they offer to share those to investors that are sub in, in interests that are subsequently traded on major stock exchanges. Exchanges, An ETF is a variation on a mutual fund, which is something that may be more commonly familiar to you guys, regulated by the Investment Company Act of 1940. There are all kinds of requirements that apply not just to the underlying assets in those funds and the makeup of those funds, but also to the governance um, of the entities that are running them and the behaviors of the individuals who are buying and selling those assets. Um, and so 
to the extent that what's happening here is the the assets that are in the Libra Reserve, the government securities and cash that they've discussed, um, are being pulled in a way that is actually operating as an ETF. We need to make sure that the entities that are part of that process are are regulated in the way that the entities that are part of the ETF structure would work. Um, there are other possibilities as well that we should consider. It's possible that whatever this is is some sort of derivative um, and should be regulated by the Commodities Futures Trading Ex uh, Commission. A derivative is a contract between two parties whose value is based on an agreed upon financial asset. So here it would be the government securities and cash and the Libra Reserve, and the derivative would be the, the agreement between Libra and the customer to pay the customer whatever the price is at the point when the customer wants to cash out. Um, so like I said, there are a lot of different potential regulatory frameworks that could apply. My guess is once we have more information about what Libra is, the exact composition of the underlying assets, it'll probably turn out that there are multiple different financial regulatory institutions that have a role in overseeing portions of the activity. Um, regardless, though, I think it's really important that we take a step back, we prohibit this from moving forward until we understand exactly what's going on here and make sure that it's regulated appropriately. Thanks, Heather. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to take just a quick step back um, to the macro level and focus on the problem this is, in theory, trying to solve. Um, so I don't know about you guys. Um, my understanding is that the ACH and SWIFT systems are over 40 years old. Um, my credit union's website is a punching bag in my household, um, and it's like seven years old. So, so clearly there needs to be a fix. Um, but like the collective action problem here is that there's this old technology um, and nobody wants to update it. I just, well, the thing I don't understand is where is it written that that fix needs to be private? Um, and then in what way is, is Facebook Libra the solution? Um, they've used two arguments, at least publicly, and I want to address those. Um, one is they'd serve, it would serve new people, and two is they would do it faster. Um, so my focus, uh, generally in my work, is about uh, serving unbanked and underbanked populations. Um, so this is what they claim that they're going to be doing. The thing is, none of the partners they've listed currently serve unbanked or underbanked folks. Um, they don't find these communities profitable now. Um, and there's no magic internet fairy dust that's going to change that calculus. Um, there's also a lot of efforts ongoing to have um, to, to speed up these the, the system. So I'll focus on like maybe maybe it's that the payments will be faster, you know, under Facebook Libra. But never mind the fact that you have to extract your money through three layers of you know like maybe through a PayPal account on the way out and like all this stuff that doesn't seem super efficient to me. But leaving that aside, if that's their point, um, there's an effort to have the Fed set up a rail to speed up real time payments. Um, so that's already in the works, or at least it's happening. I don't want to overstate, but there's there's certainly um, some energy there. Um, and you know, there's precedent within the US why our transfers are processed through the Federal Reserve System. Um, so really, I guess I just, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the problem that they're that they're trying to solve and whether they're well positioned to do it. Um, you know, if economies of scale are what they need, it's not like a tech monopoly is the only place you get economies of scale. Um, USPS has to serve all of us. Um, the post office serves all of us. So maybe that might be another place to get economies of scale. So I want to focus in on postal banking, which some of you may have heard of. There's been a letter circulating. Um, it's been getting a lot of attention lately. But just to give you sort of a quick quick update on one of those potential exciting um, alternatives. Um, so postal banking at its most modest is basic financial services like wire transfers, um, walk-in bill pay, um, money orders, um, free ATMs. Just a side note on the free ATMs thing, we all want that, but to be very clear, in banking deserts, um, there was an article recently about Ida Bana in, in Mississippi where um, the few remaining ATMs in town are at gas stations and they're $7.50 to get money out um, in a really poor area. So the idea that like, like free ATMs is, is integral to this, and I don't know any of us who would just easily drop 750, um, even at a higher higher income, and in a place where there are a lot more ATMs. So at its most advanced, um, it, 
postal banking would look like what we had in this country until the 1960s um, and what 139 other countries have currently, uh, savings accounts and small dollar lending. Um, it has been endorsed. It has been costed by the inspector general. Um, the postal unions are behind it, think tanks, consumer groups. Community groups working in banking deserts are especially keen to see it. Um, and in fact, even Danny Glover did a USA Today piece last Thursday, because it turns out both of his parents were postal workers when he was growing up. Um, there's a lot of activity going on. Um, just to name a few of the threads of activity, um, there is talk of the USPS piloting postal banking. Um, and in fact, in their collective bargaining agreement with um, the postal workers, they are required to implement at least one pilot no later than a year after the agreement terminates, which is September of this year. Um, they haven't taken any action yet. So um, Jose Serrano's office is leading, has led an office, a letter, which we'll talk about a little bit more um, to anybody who's curious, uh, to the Postmaster General requesting that that pilot actually happen. Um, Congressman Cedric Richmond has a bill um, that he that he introduced in a previous Congress and will reintroduce this year. Um, Cleveland and the Bronx have both organized uh, petition campaigns um, and submitted to the local postmaster general um, requesting that there be a pilot um, there. Um, there was language in the FSGG Appropes Act um, for USPS to find new revenue through um, financial products. And there's a report request that within 90 days um, about the feasibility of the program. So there's, just to give you sort of a taste of a potential alternate universe where um, we don't necessarily always turn to um, a tech monopoly to solve our problems, especially one that's spectacularly poorly positioned to do so. Um, you know, and I'm no expert on privacy and all the other concerns, but just to say that there is another world possible and we don't need to um, allow, allow institutions to atrophy and allow things like ACH and SWIFT to just sort of um, become inefficient and become old, um, and then and then sort of throw up our hands and say, well, we need big tech to save us. Um, that isn't necessarily the case. There is another world possible. I'm happy to answer questions on that, and also other promising um, uh, efforts like public banking and um, investment authority and other things that are in the works right now. So I'll stop there. <coughs> so thank you for organizing this and thanks for showing up. Um, so so we, we uh, open markets, we think about the problem of monopoly. We produced a, a, a pamphlet that there's probably, there might be some outside, uh, but we'll also, we, they're online. And it's our best guess as to what this project is. Um, you've heard a lot of uncertainty here because I think they're still trying to figure it out as well. Um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, the, co the competitiveness aspects of this, so competition policy, a little bit on systemic risk, and a little bit on the question of sovereignty. So as far as I understand, and there's lots of ways to say it, they're trying to create uh, two things. The, the first is a, a kind of non-sovereign parallel currency, um, and that's Libra. And the second is that they're trying to create effectively a bank. Uh, or payments, um, e-wallet, lend potentially lending services, and that's Calibra. Um, so I'll, I'll start with where I think that there's some merit, and I, I think you couched it in the form of we need a theory of what the currency system is for. You know, the, the current payment system is pretty bulky. It's pretty inefficient. There's a lot of um, rent extraction going on, a lot of fees. International wire transfers are problematic. I mean, there's a, there's it's accurate to say that our payment system is, is badly structured uh, compared to what it could be or should be. Um, and there's a long history, and part of, part of what we talk about is the chartering of the Fed, which was partially chartered to handle the payment system, which was similarly inefficient around the turn of the 20th century. But that's where I think there's something that I, that I think um, Facebook's doing us a favor by bringing this to our attention in a very aggressive, assertive way. Um, the problem that we're kind of seeing with, with this project is the rationale seems to be about servicing the unbanked. But there's just nothing about creating your own currency that has anything to do with servicing the unbanked. It's just not the same problem. You could conceivably make the argument if you're 
doing a new payment service that's you know, better or more efficient or has some cool way to do things. There are really innovative uh, services in all over Africa, um, but there's just nothing about a, n a new private parallel currency that has anything to do with the problem that they are saying they're trying to solve. So it's really confusing for us as analysts of this to try to tell you what it is. Um, but we've, we're, I think we're doing our best. So let me try to give you what I think the thinking is behind these projects. Um, not 100% sure. Um, but I'll read two quotes from Mark Zuckerberg. So first one is, Facebook is more like a government than a business. In many ways, we're really setting policies. Right? And this gets to the question of monopoly. There are, they have dominant market power in social networking and in certain forms of online targeted advertising. They set the terms and conditions by which most of us engage with social media, not entirely, but in, in a lot of different ways. Um, Zuckerberg's already doing things that are sort of sovereign-ish, like the Supreme Court for content curation. The second is a, uh, from an email in 2012, where Zuckerberg said uh, about payments, if we make it so developers can generate revenue for us in different ways, including payments, then it makes it more acceptable us for, uh, for us to charge them quite a bit more for using our platform. Right? So that was the thinking in 2012. There's a lot has changed since 2012, but that's basically what Facebook's trying to do in general. They're trying to centralize commerce on their platform so that they can monetize it, so they can bundle it, so they can set the terms and conditions. They're doing this in ways with Instagram, um, and they're doing it in different ways with the platforms that they're creating. And at this point, it looks like they're trying to leverage their power in one part of the economy into power over payments. That's my guess, not 100% sure. So let me talk a little bit about um, competition. Just historically, the US, we've separated our banking and commerce. Really, since the Civil War, you could go back earlier. And that's so that there's no conflicts of interest in business. Um, it's also because um, you know, there's, there's uh, instability that you introduce when a business is a also a bank. Um, so you know, to give you a sense of what this could, if this takes off, um, Facebook could have control over processing fees from soup to nuts in a transaction. Processing fees, credit terms, advertising, um, the relationship between the merchant and the the advertiser and the buyer in terms of the communications network, and even things like debt collection. So from soup to nuts, Facebook ha could potentially have control of all of that. And historically in the US, we just haven't allowed that kind of institution to emerge. Um, this would also give enormous surveillance capacity into the rest of the economy, and it would help Facebook have data that would just be unparalleled for using for uh, targeted advertising. Now they say they won't use this financial information for targeted advertising, but even just having a crypto wallet on your Facebook account gives them a lot of information that no one else would have. Um, the third, the second piece is systemic risk. I won't go into that because I think you guys covered it well. I'll just say, Sheila Bear has noted that that what the Libra Reserve looks a lot like the pre-2008 unregulated money market system um, that collapsed with Lehman Brothers and led to a financial crisis. Uh, and and post post 2008, um, but weirder and probably less well thought out. There is a there is a kind of neo colonial aspect to it as well. I mean, we talk about the U.S., but in 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 foreign countries, you know, a lot of are abroad in a bunch of different countries, a lot of the our laws don't apply, debt collection laws, but also you know, do you want monetary policy for some unstable um, or or country with a weak banking regime set by some people in Palo Alto? That that's a an important question that we, we probably should think about. Um, so the third is, is sovereignty. Um, the Constitution vests Congress with coining money for a reason. These are very contested political questions. There's a strong national security interest in having control over currency. The use of the dollar as a reserve currency is an important national security um, weapon and um, tool, and maybe it shouldn't be. Maybe it should be, but that's a debate that we should have democratically. Um, these uh, sanctions regime involve, uh, and, and um, uh, the laws that um, enable bank regulation deal with counterterrorism, money laundering, uh, law enforcement, and the projection and use of US power to deal with um, financial crises, lender of last resort facilities, bank deposits, 
um, swap lines among central banks. These are really core functions of a state. Um, they're core functions of our, in many ways, our, our defense, uh, some of our defense agencies. And this will affect those and potentially undermine those. And we need to be very careful before we do that. So I guess the last piece is that, you know, the Fed was chartered in 1913. And one of the things that the Fed did is it cleaned up a very fragmented and broken uh, check clearing infrastructure. And what's probably the right thing to do is to have the Fed, you know, or, or Treasury or the government doing what they do on paper. I mean, this is a public option type of model, but this is just a core function of sovereignty. It makes sense for them to be doing, you know, the printing of dollar coins or however you want to talk about it. So the question really comes down to this. Who is governing, right? Is it, do we have, at this point we're asking the question, do we have a democratic government or do we have a private government um, that's in Palo Alto or wherever, you know, this, this Libra, or well, I guess they'll put their money in Switzerland. Um, that's, that's really the question, and that's the question I think you guys should be thinking about. So thanks for showing up. and. This I found learned a lot. Thank you. So uh, we'll move to audience questions in a second. But let me just ask if anybody on the panel has you know, burning responses or elaborations upon one another's comments. Okay. Um, okay. Then let's just uh, see if you guys have questions. Um, anybody want to start? Sure. Um, I was wondering, is it possible that? <coughs> This is not like Ripple in the sense where you issue a certain amount of currency and it's floating. The whole idea of this is it's going to be backed one to one by a set of high value assets. And so, anyone that's if, to do that, you would have to invest the initial assets into the system. So, you're putting your skin in the game in their theory. So, their whole approach is it should be almost indifferent to how many people are adding assets in because the amount of Libra that's being generated is identical. Now, I think obviously certain entities are going to put more skin in the game in, in investment terms. And you see this in other contexts, for example, open source foundations, Hyperledger, Linux Foundation, and things. These large companies who for a long time were resistant to that model have now come in and put a huge amount of money in and just by that virtue have a large amount of influence. But I don't think this is a situation where it's a matter of hoarding a number of the initial reserve and then handing them out on a sort of preferential basis. Anybody else? So obviously there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of things that we don't know about labor. There's a lot of unanswered questions. Um, yeah, I met with David Marcus today, and he, you know, almost the answer to almost every one of my questions was, well, that'll be spelled out in the Labor Association Charter. Uh, what is the biggest unanswered question for you that like they have not answered that, that will? That what is what does the Labor Association Charter say? <laughs> <laughs> I mean that it. I'm I, like honestly, that is the biggest unanswered question. Like, what is this? Right. I mean, is it in terms of like who has voting power or that kind of thing? Or I mean, I want I want to know. I mean, there's so many there's so many, you know, aspects here. But who? Why are they putting the Libra Reserve in Switzerland and who regulates it? I mean, it's you don't put pots of money in Switzerland because you're into transparency, right? <laughs> so. I don't. I mean, I'm. I I hate feeling like I'm just so skeptical of of Facebook. I think they've earned a certain amount of skepticism. But you know, that I I it, this is the kind of situation where they're really just throwing. They're just hoping that our democratic institutions can't stop this. That's really what this is about. They're just like we're going to bet that the Fed is lazy, that Congress won't do anything, and that we're just going to introduce this and launch it, and it's going to get so intertwined with commerce that people will just accept it because they have to. And that's, that's really the question here. So I want to know why they're, um, what the Libra Association says. And, and um, uh, maybe, maybe I'd ask, you know, when, um, what would cause you to pull the plug? Can I just, real quick, like, yes, there are a lot of unknowns and a lot of questions. But for me, I'm surprised how few questions there are about what, about it's clear what their motives are to monetize our uh, uh, our sort of social relationships and to um, exploit a resource we're not that comfortable with them exploiting. Like so, on some level, like there are a lot of questions about the details. There aren't 
there isn't really any question about the intention, right? I mean, it's like kind of clear. Like, so for me, it's like, yes, they are trying to do something that we probably, it probably isn't in our interest for them to do. So on some level, like, I feel like the question's sort of answered and I don't really buy the whole like uh, stated motivation, serving more folks, you know, all that. So I've looked at this, I, I've spent more time thinking about securities law than other aspects of the law, and so my questions have focused on whether this is an ETF or some sort of money market mutual fund. And for those questions, you know, they have this language in the white paper, Libra is fully backed by a reserve of real assets. A basket of bank deposits and short-term government securities will be held in the Libra Reserve for every Libra that is created. And so I have a ton of questions that revolve around unpacking exactly what that means. Like, what are the assets? What is the nature of the account in which they will be held? Is there going to be one big pool and then there will be interests that are sold off? Um, is there leverage embedded in this system? Like, is the value of the underlying assets dollar for dollar, or um, or are they going to issue more Libra than there are actually assets underlying it? And, and um, that exacerbates the likelihood or potential of a systemic risk. Um, so I, I think there are, there are huge questions and democratic questions like <laughs> of the sort that that Matt have raised because of where my mind goes when I look at things like this, those are the questions that I've been thinking about. Um, yeah, so I, I've, I've been following this stuff for a while, going back to mobile money operators in, in sub-Saharan Africa. So I, this looks very similar to a number of other things, except for the fact that it's trying to be global. And, and that's the real kind of crux of it to me is that I know these other ones where their limits are and whether their strengths are, but I think because it's got this huge con consumer base around the world, then it thinks it's in a different position to engage in matters of international finance. And when it comes to, for example, swap lines, there isn't a public international law of swap lines. Dan Ori at Oxford's done a great job showing that they, there should be, but there isn't a, an actual body of public international law. And the fact that Facebook has 1.8 billion um, customers doesn't mean that its business model is accountable to 1.8 billion people and certainly not accountable equally across those nations. So I think the question I have for them is if you think you're positioning yourself to be a global leader in finance. Why is it that your business model and corporate structure makes you more accountable to the actual people across the world than the existing international <laughs> legal and political organizations that are already developing infrastructure to do many of the services you're claiming? Let, let me give you an example of one of the things that could happen. If Libra was functional and integrated into the global financial system, and we saw a replay of the Eurozone crisis, I could imagine a whole lot of people in Greece just, you know, buying Libra so that they wouldn't have to, you know, chance that, you know, Greece might leave the Eurozone. And that would cause, um, a, that would cause a crash in the Greek uh, banking system. But you see this in lots of different countries. I mean, there's a reason that the, you know, that um, we're very careful with deposit insurance to not allow foreign um, exposure to deposit insurance because if you do, then all of a sudden one day, you know, Italy's banking problem or Zimbabwe's banking problem or whatever becomes your banking problem. So, you know, who knows what ends up happening with something like Libra? If it is as stable as they say, then all of a sudden it's going to attract a lot of the banking problems that you know you're going to. What you said was exposure to national um, banking problem risk, which are which are real and happen on a fairly regular basis. I would just add one, one point that I think is worth interrogating. This isn't really a question. Is just I, I think it's pretty clear they're trying to obscure the extent to which Facebook has control over the system, at least at the outset, by one, you know, speaking to uh, the the crypto and you know, blockchainy aspects of it and trying to mystify people using that language, um, and on the other hand, by uh, in some moments speaking to what the Libra Association will do as opposed to what Facebook itself will do. And you've got these moments where they assert that the Libra Association will not have visibility into you know, real-time uh, payments um, and so on. Uh, but it's clear that if the, the bulk of use of this is through Calibra wallets at the outset, that Facebook itself will have quite a lot of visibility into that and will cer certainly be looking for ways to exploit it. And I think they're intentionally doing a dance there. 
Here's a question that I just thought of. Okay, who bails you out if you get into trouble? Yeah, in, in, in the 2008 crisis, when they set up an emergency swap line system that then became permanent, you know, on a rainy Wednesday um, on a, in a press release, they, the uh, U.S. Federal Reserve was exposed to the ECB to a tune of $500 billion. Now, that was already arguably not democratically accountable the way that that was done. Certainly, there weren't hearings talking about that in the way that $787 billion came up as a public number. Um, but if, if Facebook tried to defend an a foreign exchange value to ensure that a whole country's you know user base didn't suddenly find out that their Libra was kind of worthless in their local currency or vice versa. <laughs> How would they be doing that? Whose swap lines would they be relying on? What central banks would fundamentally be bearing that liquidity and exposure? Because right now, there is no payments layer at the bottom of this system. It defers to banks, and then those banks defer to central banks. So this is all built on top of public infrastructure, even while claiming to be something outside and independent and parallel to it. Let's, um, I see more and more hands popping up. So who, okay. Uh, well, let's, in the, in the back first. Um, so what I've heard so far is there's all these problems with it. And so I'm just curious, what is the, what's in it for the consumer? So if it's unstable, um, it's under a bank, it's not for the underbanked uh, population, it's not very transparent, um, what are we worried about? Who, who's gonna use this and think it's a great idea and all of a sudden a, a billion people are using it if there's just problems and nothing good for it? So what, what are the advantages for a consumer who might choose this over something else you mentioned the Greek case, and, and in terms of a euro crisis, they might turn to this. But on a daily basis, what are we worried about? What's the consumer have in for them that's positive? Well, I can imagine them, you know, creating a uh, an 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 easy to use app that's integrated into Facebook, WhatsApp, um, Instagram, making you know shopping frictionless, getting around international wire transfer fees. I mean, there's a lot of things in our maybe do micro uh, micro transactions. I mean, there's a lot of things that our payment system is really bad at. And it's because, you know, Fed really just hasn't done anything to improve the payment systems. I'll just give you a quick example. Um, in 2014, the Fed started talking about real time um, clearing, right? So you write a check used to take, you know, five days to clear in the US. And that, that's crazy all over the world. It takes, you know, very small amount of time. But in the US, our system is still based on the system set up in the 1970s, which is effectively controlled by an association of banks, since there's just no reason to improve it when you have a monopoly. Um, so the Fed started thinking about this in 2014. And then in um, 2018, they put out a request uh, for a proposal. And the, in the meantime, these big banks set up their own real-time payments network. And then when the Fed put out its request for proposal on standards for their own system, the, the banks, the large banks said, hey, um, we're going to raise our, if you do this, we're going to raise our prices on the small banks that need access to our real-time clearing system and sort of intimidated the Fed into not doing it. And then you see this over and over and over. There's been a wave of mergers in our payments uh, and, and sort of core payment processors. You see interchange fees are way too high. International transfer fees are probably too high. So, I, and you know, you don't see microtransactions. You don't see easy ways to pay. There is Venmo and a couple of other things. So to this is a failure of governance, right? And what Facebook is doing is they're filling the gap of a failure of governance, but they're doing it in a way that's highly unstable and dangerous. The response to this isn't to say Facebook shouldn't do it. That's only, well, that's part of the response. There's a, there's a number of ways to do that. Uh, at least that's our recommendation. The response to this is to say, you know, there are real problems with our payment system, and let's improve those. Let's take care of those. Let's fix those as we've done in the past so that we can maintain systemic stability and encourage commerce and so on and so forth. Um, and then prevent this kind of grab for power, this grab for private government. Just a quick note, I, I don't know if this will play out the way that Amazon did, but thinking about how originally, um, you know, the books were a little cheaper on Amazon and it's been a while since that has been true, but I can imagine that you know that the that the the barriers to entry are sort of lowered um, considerably. And then once we're in, and you're a monopoly, there's no incentive to treat your customers right, you know. But I can see that coming in, you know, is a little easier than getting out. I mean, my understanding is that redeeming it, you have to deposit into a PayPal account, so that's three layers between you and your money. So it's kind of like, you can check in, but you can never leave, you know? Like, so I can see that it would be initially a lot easier, maybe, um, but that the business model would probably not continue to stay that way. 
Um, yeah, so first of all, looking from my experience with, when I go to China and look at how they use WeChat there, the whole idea is to keep you on their platform forever. Right? You don't need the rest of the internet because everything is within their platform. And so the first thing is just integration within the Facebook ecosystem is the first thing. The second thing is aesthetics. And they've got a huge number of people trying to you know, optimize the experience of using their interface to keep you there, keep you salivating, make it bright and flashy, all those kinds of things. They're going to put a lot of money into that in a way that individual governments don't necessarily. There's also a combination of sublayer interoperability. They build the ecosystem and everybody has to Op operate on their terms like with Amazon they capture everything there and people can benefit from that in the short term until they stop benefiting when it, once it becomes a monopoly and the other thing is when you're a small country and they've got very deep pockets they can come in and basically bedazzle you with a huge amount of if FDI that you otherwise wouldn't have that's what happened almost in India when they were proposing their version of the Facebook internet that was going to be a sort of stripped down everything goes through Facebook version of the regular internet the other thing is it looks like a good business model until it breaks and the point here is they are very fuzzy on all of the risk assessments that people who've had experience in international financial systems look at for when it breaks. So they want to focus on the positives and or, or sort of what it would look like when it's working as best possible outcomes. And in that, mo in that moment, it looks like it's a good value proposition. You might get a better interest rate or cheaper rates, etc. It's just when the whole system crashes, there's only two options. One is it gets socialized and, and all of the costs and all the risks have to be borne by the taxpayer on the back end. Or two, it collapses and causes a huge amount of damage. Uh, what's wrong with the wait and see approach? So we, we don't really know what the, the costs and the benefits are yet. Why not let it launch, look at it, and see uh, how to evaluate it once we're there? I think as we've seen in other situations in the past, it's really hard to put the cat back in the bag <laughs> after it's out. Um, once the system is up and running, once people get their accounts on, the unraveling of that system can be really complicated. And the problems will not be clear until we're in the heat of a crisis. And so you don't want to wait until the crisis is upon us to try to figure out how we resolve the crisis. In terms of the wait and see approach, first of all, they're asking for exceptional treatment right now. The bank of, uh, one of the governors of the Bank of France said, if they are really doing this right, they're going to need a banking license in every single country in which they're operating. They're not trying to do that. They're trying to get around that. So if we really want a wait and see approach, make them follow all the laws they should be accountable to right now. Then we can wait and see whether they deserve exceptions that they're claiming they want or need. So here and then the woman in the back. Um, and I'll, we'll try to, we've got the room till five. Do you see this as posing any acute problems for money laundering or things like that? That's something we haven't touched on yet. Uh, it could. It could. It's it's not um, it's not obvious how they would handle you know the significant compliance costs and and management structures you'd need for that. You know, I think we've seen that Facebook has. Um, has not done a particularly good job with data protection and privacy regimes. Um, and then I think there's another angle to this, which is the global nature of the currency, so, or of what they're, of the system they're setting up. So let's just assume that they do set it up and it becomes intertwined in our commercial arteries and people are using it all over the world. And the US says, we want you to do this, we want you to stop dealing with this guy who's, you know, um, falls within our sanctions regime, or we have this activity we want to prohibit. And um, maybe another country, which Facebook needs something from, says, actually, we, we give you a different law that says you have to serve as this guy, or you have to do this thing that's against US law. Then all of a sudden, you have Facebook making the determination about which laws they're going to choose to follow. So I think that's like something that is when you when you sort of delegate core state activities to a private third party, like you have the risk of them just maybe defining money laundering differently or saying, oh well, we're we're gonna we're gonna follow your law when it comes to your domestic situation, but if we're gonna facilitate the transactions between two third parties in in third party countries, then your laws don't apply. That isn't how it works with the dollar right now. I mean, we have. You know, when you clear in dollars, you have to obey U.S. law. When Libra is sort of sort of a dollar, but not really, 
it's a total like kind of gray area. So you're talking about potentially undermining very important areas of of, um, uh, of national control. Um, so I, I think one thing is they're going to make sure that this system is surveillable so that they can data mine it. There's going to be some layer where this data is going to be accessible. And I think at the moment it becomes advantageous for them economically or politically to hand over the keys to that to any particular national security agency around the world, whether it's allies or enemies, they'll do that, um, especially if there's some leverage placed on high members of this company. And remember, Facebook is still a privately held company at this point. I mean, uh, Zuckerberg still owns a significant controlling share, which means you know you only need to put leverage on one person for that to be a national security risk. Um, the, I think the bigger challenge is that right now we are collapsing two different kinds of payment systems into what Facebook is trying to fix. One is bank accounts or an account-based system. The other is the equivalent of a cash or a bearer instrument where you own the money in your pocket. And there are different rules for privacy and, 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 and money laundering and know your customer and all all these things around those in recognition of the fact that there's a lot of transactional freedom that individuals enjoy that would be undermined in a system where you have to ask permission for every transaction. If you're declared an enemy of the state or a politically unsavory person, you can have your entire bank account shut down. So I think the real challenge is actually going to be how we develop a framework that, that takes into consideration valid anti-money laundering know your customer concerns while also preserving the consumer freedom that comes with cash. And Sweden is the only country I've seen when they're looking at government digital fiat currency or central bank digital currency that has explicitly said, we're moving away from cash. 95% of transactions in the country aren't cash anymore. We have an obligation to provide cash-like services as a central bank. Therefore, when we think about central bank digital currency, we need something that mimics the function of cash for average consumers. We might cap it at $200 or whatever, but we need something that allows people to have that feeling that the money is mine. It's not in some bank that could go under and also that I can engage in transactions without getting approval from Big Brother. So how the European regulatory regime has responded and impacts of GDPR, if any? I, you know, I, I, I can't. I mean, they've, they've responded with, I think, something similar to the US in terms of just sort of puzzlement. I don't know how GDPR will relate to this. I mean, it seems like GDPR is its own kind of weird set of laws that aren't really being enforced um, on Facebook and Google as it is. Um, so. Sort of, Facebook doesn't need to, to Facebook do, uh, doesn't anonymize data. They know who you are. So it, it sort of has to do with, with um, uh, I guess, with third-party data and whether you're, you're opt-in or not. But that's not really a problem for Facebook because when you use Facebook, you're, you, know, they know, you know, they know who you are. I think there are some problems on, in terms of publishers. But again, it's not, it's not really being enforced. So you haven't seen... Um, so that the enforcement regime is working itself out, and I'm not, I mean, I don't even know how to think about it in the context of this kind of system. I think Matt's point earlier is also right, that they're going to choose jurisdictions in which to have these fights is the first thing. The second thing is with the rise of these private arbitration agreements, a lot of the interesting legal questions are going to be determined in private arbitration rather than common law courts, which means you're not going to see the development of a coherent body of common law, certainly one that can be internationally compared. And the other element here is that the ECB, first of all, um, uh, Christine Lagarde, was one of the only people in the last year is a sort of at her level who gave a, a positive statement about the possibility of government issued digital currency. A lot of the other central bankers and policymakers are more, were more kind of cautious. She was quite optimistic. Um, and also uh, Cuero, who's number two or three at the ECB, is also the head of the stablecoin team at the G8. So I think they're looking pretty proactively about some sort of European level currency, but they've also got an additional layer of central bank infrastructure to deal with with their target two payment system. So in addition to banks, central banks, they also have this meta central bank clearing layer, national central banks going up to the ECB. So if we think about these foreign currency liquidity 
issues and the fact that they're going to be buying all of these assets. I mean, imagine they're talking about safe assets and they buy some European bonds, but are they buying German bonds? Are they buying Greek bonds? What if that causes a spread? You know, if the, there's another Greek crisis or something. So I think there's a lot of issues they have to deal with at the federal level that's going to make them a lot less willing to to let Facebook just do whatever it wants. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that losing Europe means that this project is going to go under. If they get 30 smaller countries and they can just strong arm them in, then that still makes them a significant force for the European Union to contend with, even if it's outside their jurisdiction. And also just to say, having spent a little time on European advocacy, you know, it may be that Germany has really strong privacy laws, but um, it's the same as it is globally, that there are 28 options, right? And generally, whoever holds the presidency, you know, is going to is gonna, you know, be it's gonna be a race to the bottom. So like maybe it's, you know, maybe it's Poland or maybe it's somewhere else that's gonna like drag the dialogue down and the tremendous amount of transaction costs getting something through European Parliament, getting something through the Commission, getting it through the trialogue process, which makes us look easy. Um, I wouldn't pin all my hopes on Europe, though sometimes we've been tempted to do so. Um, here, um, and then yours has been up for a while. I'm sorry if I'm trying to do my best. <laughs> Thank you. Um, could you explain how or if Facebook having this Libra currency would be different from it operating like a PayPal, so it's a wallet, but also doing some kind of investing for you? Um, I'm sure you'd still have concerns if they were um, a wallet and some kind of mutual fund, but how does them using it for Libra as opposed to a dollar make that more concerning? So when they are using PayPal, for example, there is still a bank that is holding your assets, that is responsible for managing the underlying transactions, and that is subject to all of the banking regulations. Um, what they are proposing to do now is actually create a new currency and a new entity that will hold your assets and be responsible for processing those transactions that appears at this moment to be conceived of in order to evade all of those laws and regulations. So, so Lib first of all, a, a contract denominated in Libra poses a lot of interesting questions at the state enforcement level because if you're having a, countries with legal tender laws or where damages are denominated in, in your local unit of account, one of the questions is how do you value that? Is it the value on the day? Is it the value if you're exchanging it within Libra? If is it the value if you're exchanging it on foreign exchange markets? And the, the other thing is there's no theory I've seen yet that Facebook's articulated of their foreign exchange policy. So if you have a system where I could, you know, do a bilateral currency swap with one country and then do another currency swap with another country and come back, I could end up with a very different value from that than what Facebook is offering in a, in a bilateral sense or through their Libra currency, because they're not only offering foreign currency swaps they're, or, or foreign currency trading, they're trying to maintain an integral unit of account across those currencies. And when it's when you when it comes to you know enforcement of no contracts de denominated nominally, then courts are going to have to interpret that back in their own currencies and that causes a huge amount of problems. And those a lot of the questions that you raise are defined for the existing entities right, right. that are subject to regulation. Oh, so the other thing is Libra as well. We we calling it a currency here. That's very favorable. <laughs> like that's that's being very generous. That if you look at four different regulatory agencies, they're going to define it as a you know a, a currency, property, a security, a commodity, a derivative, and it could be all of them. And I think one of the points here is our legal categories for these instruments were created for a different era. And what we're seeing right now is the reason those categories aren't working exactly is because these instruments don't match exactly one of those categories. And either we can let Facebook define their own instrument and then create a legal regime around it and sort of play catch up, or we can try to actually work out what the purpose of those functional categorizations was in that moment in history and what it would take to upgrade them together in a coordinated sense. And the fact we've got FSOC now and these kind of meta agencies that are trying to think about it across the board means we actually have the infrastructure to do that. But if we just let Facebook define it themselves and, and, and sort of let them set the agenda, then it's going to be another generation of catch up and we won't be dealing with those questions until another crisis forces us to. And another, another issue, I'm sorry. Um, so one other issue is, is that they haven't described kind of how they're going to handle uh, currency fluctuations and rebalancing of the Libra reserve. So the currencies, like let's say they say that a Libra is worth, you know, it's it's 50% made up of a dollar, 25% yen, 25% euro. 
And then the only people that are excited to use it are people in Japan. They're going to get a whole bunch of yen buying Libra. When do they rebalance that? Right? What if the yen goes up versus the dollar and down versus the euro? Like, when do they rebalance that? How does that work? Uh, when you buy Libra, you know, what is the value? Is it that they rebalance it every month? You know, when, so it's just. What if the Bank of Japan disagrees and, and fights against it? It's, it's, there's just a lot of. Again, I'd like to see what what's in the um, charter, but it's it's um, it's just not it's just not obvious. What they ha I just don't think these they've thought through these problems, and either they manage the reserve aggressively to maintain some sort of value, which I don't think they want to do, or they just let it float and rebalance it occasionally, which potentially leaves it open to speculative attack or central bank, you know, disagreements or just. Weird things that happen if a lot of people in a country, it says a lot of people in Greece want to buy Libra and nobody in America is interested because we already have this thing called the dollar, which works pretty well. Also, I don't think we've touched on the whole layer of uh, caps gains questions and realization of gains or losses that fall from the implications. I mean, just to like layer on another level of simplicity there. Because, um, yeah, if you cha change your, you move Libra in and out of the system, you have capital gains. And, um, or losses. But it's hacked. And, and PayPal, PayPal tried to get away without a license for a long time on that, you know, tried to invest in other instruments or withhold that interest. Eventually had to get a banking license because it wasn't able to engage in its business model without doing so. I mean, honestly, I don't know if this is still on or not. Yeah, it's, dead. it's on. Okay. Dead. I mean, this is up to Congress. But the Fed, has, the Congress has delegated its power over the currency to Congress. Sorry, the con Congress has dele delegated it to the Fed, and so the Fed could act. They don't have a particularly assertive posture on these kinds of questions. They should act aggressively to manage and protect the payment system, but Congress should really step in if they don't. Um, and that's to the extent that what they are issuing is, in fact, a currency, um, to the extent that it's a security or a derivative or some other type of financial product, then those agencies have an obligation to step in and evaluate what's going on and determine whether, whether this should be subject to regulation from their respective jurisdictions. And my guess is you'd see the opposite, in fact. You'd see a lot of agencies, like with the regulation of cryptocurrencies in general, a lot of agencies saying, actually, this is within our mandate. We can't let this go. And then the question is, how do you manage that jurisdictional kind of hodgepodge? And I think that one of the risks is that the company will benefit from playing these entities off against each other or, or benefit from this ambiguity and be able to set the agenda. The reality is, though, that we have a ton of financial institutions right now that have aspects of their activities regulated by different parts of the government. Um, if you look at Citigroup or J.P. Morgan um, or Goldman Sachs, or you know, they've got Federal Reserve regulation, FINRA regulation, SEC regulation, OCC, FDIC, you know, state regulation. So it, it's not, and they still manage to operate a tremendous profit. So um, I think. I think what's likely if each of the regulators steps up and does what they are responsible for doing right now, that this entity will be subject to regulation for different aspects of its activity by different regulators. Well, and if I may, it seems like the the it's it's not a it's not a bug that this this regulatory question, it's a feature. Like the whole point is to not be regulated. <laughs> so like or to be regulated in an arbitrage way where you can find the lowest common denominator. But like that is not sort of incidental to the design, at least as they have as much as they have allowed us to see. It is part of the design. I think one this is where actually the international dimension adds a new wrinkle compared to maybe a lot of these others. I mean, there's obviously a lot of big international financial companies, but the fact this coin is trying to be a supranational unit of account, um, the Treasury actually has provisions allowing it to step in 
and tell the Fed what to do when it comes to foreign exchange management, when it's the interest of national security for preserving the value of the, the currency. And I think this is an example where you would very quickly see security interests, executive agency interests that go beyond the regular mandate of the Fed when it comes to macroprudential policy, monetary policy, financial regulation. This would quickly become a foreign policy issue. So the, the one other piece is, is um, you know, this is a, f a question of competition policy as well. And that division between banking and commerce is a pretty... It's a pretty strong one in the U.S. Historically, it has been, and so when you're, you're also talking the bank holding the bank holding company act, where you know financial institutions are regulated by lots of different um, agencies, but this is Facebook's not a financial institution. It's an ad company. It's a social network, and we have traditionally not let, you know, th there's there's a little bit of bleeding over. You know, GE does customer financing. And there's ILCs and stuff like that, but like it's not. This is a really, really, really big. Bright and like violation of a, of a strong historical bright line rule in American commerce and banking. It's a good way to say it's a good segue to Jordan, who also gets rank as the uh, liaison from the organizing office. Um, so I, I think we've all laid out very well what's in Facebook's why this is in Facebook's interest, but I expect them to emphasize on Wednesday that this is a partnership, and so I wondered if you could speak to. Uh, what might be in it for Spotify or Uber or Lyft um, or Visa or MasterCard on the subject of the payment system. And then secondly, I also anticipate that they will, uh, when asked about questions of collusion, emphasize that there are some direct competitors and provide some examples of how direct competitors have colluded in the past. And just because you're a direct competitor doesn't mean that you won't collude. Sure. Um, so I, I think, when, first of all, uh, there's a noticeable absence of certain kinds of companies in, in that list, right? B big banks, right? Banks, particularly entities that have a banking license. <laughs> um, the, the fact that Visa and MasterCard are both built on top of the banking system and have already kind of worked out how to navigate the international dimension through sort of correspondent relationships and things, I think shows that this is not trying to replicate a national currency. It's trying to do something at that international layer. I think one of the things about Uber, for example, is it was a it was a regulatory, you know, undermining business model masquerading as a company. And so if you if you look at what Facebook might be able to achieve with this, even if it loses the US, even if it loses the uh, EU, it might get 30 or 40 smaller countries that simply don't have the financial and political capacity to stand against its full efforts. And if it does that, if it manages to capture a number of countries like that, then it's got a seat at the table globally at, 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 a, at a government level in a way that Visa and MasterCard were never able to do and a way that individual national banks with charters in one country won't be able to compete with either. Um, the other thing is I think it's a pretty good, you know, I don't think we have to claim that MasterCard and Visa are sort of very competitive already. I think this is just an example of further consolidation of, of these industries. And when you sort of combine finance, data mining, um, and and the kind of social media platform models, then it's, it's something very new um, and more concentrated than before. We've had conversations speculating on, on the same uh, the same question, and I, I don't think that uh, I, I don't think I've heard any good answers. The one that came to my mind was that perhaps looking ahead to a potential change in regime or you know in political leadership in the U.S. in a couple of years, um, there's an interest in trying to get this approved or through past the U.S. regulators. Uh, before we get another president who might be more open to or strict about financial regulation? I, I think they've wanted to do this for a long time. Uh, I don't know about this specific setup, but this is something that, you know, Zuckerberg's been talking about for at least seven years, probably more than that. They have money, service business licenses. They've had them for a long time. They experimented with payments, I guess, in 2010, 11, 12. So they want to do this, and then they all have, um, all the big tech platforms have WeChat Envy, right? So they want to be like WeChat or Alipay. So I, 
you know, if I had to guess as to why, it's probably because they spent the last year trying to deal with like scandals and they didn't have time to launch new uh, product lines. And now they're, they, like, I think they sort of feel like they've gotten a handle on their scandals and are, are saying, okay, well, we, we now have time to launch, you know, to innovate. There are so many s comments I just didn't say, but there were, they're, in, they're in here. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to say that. I think the other thing is if you look at the, the way that the digital currency conversation and energy has evolved over that time, it started off with people saying we're going to completely replace all money. Right? And then, then it was we're going to create a private currency that's going to compete and then it's going to provide a kind of opt-out from this financial, from the regular financial system. Now you're talking about a bunch of actually licensed banks mostly creating permissioned, trusted platforms that function more like a central clearinghouse or some sort of you know, uh, over-the-counter trading mar derivatives market or something or a trading desk. Um, and at that point, the kind of we're going to blow the whole currency system up versus we're going to be a bank with slightly more flexibility. It's sort of evolved. And once it's here, then it's easy for Facebook to jump on and say, oh, okay, if, if JP Morgan can do it, we can do it as well. The, the business model is much more adjacent to their existing activities and an easy into a market that they wanted to get into. So if they wanted to try and compete with JP Morgan, but not on terrain that JP Morgan's been doing for 150 years, then what you do is you wait till there's a tech framework and you say it's all brand new, we're shaking everything up. And then they get to come in from the ground, ground floor as a, as a sort of equally viable um, competitor. Or they let Bitcoin tick all the punches and now they're <laughs> moving in. Right. Um, I know that like, uh, other cryptocurrencies have had use by um, bad actors like human traffickers and um, terror, terror organizations. What, what are the um, features of those uh, currencies that make them attract to those actors? And has Facebook indicated what they will do to prevent that from happening on their um, platform? Well, I, th I think that part of it is just that when you're running, I think, yeah. what's the joke? The joke is like, oh, man, I'm tired, so I don't remember the joke. But something along the lines of <laughs> everyone starts, you know, a, a cryptocurrency pledging to help the unbanked, and then they end up just kind of helping people buy heroin online or whatever it is. Um, and um, but there, there was a that's just kind of like the way that these things kind of move, because the use case here, like sovereign currencies are it's a pretty good product. Right. I mean, I've never had a problem using a dollar at a store that accepts dollars and same thing for euros and same thing for, I mean, it's, it works, right? So what are they really trying to do? I mean, they're, they're trying to attack a product that works. And the use case is for the dollars don't work particularly well or when you're trying to buy illicit things or you're trying to do illicit things. And so that's usually the use case that when you're like, oh, I've got this really fancy new way to get around all these problems that, that like sovereign currencies, you know, cause. Well, the problems that they cause is that it's harder to do things that sovereign countries laws you know, they pass laws to say, don't do that kind of thing. So, you know, the way that I think Facebook is saying that they're going to avoid getting into that kind of, you know, Bitcoin uh, kind of a model where they're enabling all sorts of illicit activity is they're going to, they're saying, um, uh, we're going to follow all relevant, um, you know, anti-money laundering laws, near customer laws, and so on and so forth. So that that's what they're saying. Yeah, th I think the... Uh it was like what, a week ago that there was a tanker with like 100 tons of cocaine that belongs to JP Morgan. So I don't know, I'm as worried about the regular bay financial industries and, and as I am about these private ones. And I think after Dread Pirate Robert's case, um, it was it was mostly small kind of retail kind of criminals who are engaging in that kind of dark web activity. And I think that case has probably scared the hell out of them and made them realize that the, the reach of the federal law enforcement is sufficient to get into those systems. Um, I haven't seen any actual in, in, in information about how Facebook plans on keeping Know Your Customer anti-money laundering. What I do know from my experience in the central bank digital currency space is China's got the framing they're now using is uh, managed anonymity, which is actually kind of Facebook-esque. You know, Mark Zuckerberg used to talk about privacy settings on Facebook, and it's, you know, how much would you like your friends to see while, while Mark Zuckerberg, your super friend, gets to see everything? So I think China's managed anonymity is, you know, anonymity for you and the company or you and your counterparty, but the People's Bank of China gets to see everything. Um, and, and in India, you've got the Adha system with a centralized database, again, with a huge amount of security concerns. So I think the, the real question here is, this thing's gonna be surveilled as hell. <laughs> That's why they wanna build it, so to data mine it. The real question is, who's gonna get access and when are those anti-money laundering rules actually gonna get applied? And that is probably about as well as they're currently being applied, which is not very well. I, do, I wanna say two basic things about Facebooks in, in, in a non-financial kind of space, which which I think is relevant here. One of the things we talk about when we're 
thinking about privacy is is um, people assume, oh, are there, is somebody spying on me as a consumer? But the real way to understand the problem with privacy is that it's about business privacy. It's about the privacy, like Amazon or, or Google or Facebook are more interested not in maybe your information, but in the relationships that you have with merchants or the relationships that you have with publishers. And those are, and what they're doing is they're redirecting revenue that used to go to those businesses to themselves. So that's really the, you know, that that's, we're talking about business information privacy. So think about the kinds of, of business information privacy that this, you know, surveillance that this will enable. Every business in the economy, every business on the Libra platform or, or that, where Calibra is, a, is, a, is in effect, will effectively have their most important information, which is the money flows. Facebook will know all of that. And then Facebook can use that in any way that it chooses. That's a pretty uh, important problem. And, so, and the second part is, is Facebook has a track record of promising to um, not track things and use them for advertising and then doing it anyway. So this is... Um, one of the things you guys know when you like go onto a third party website and you you see a like button or you see a share button you so the open web tools so facebook launched those in 2010 and they said to all of their publishing partners don't worry stick this code on your site and we won't track we will track people only because we have to like know who's using those buttons but we won't use that for targeted advertising in 2014 and the publishers would not have have put those on their site had that uh, had they thought that they were going to use that as targeted advertising, because that's direct competition. Um, in 2014, after these buttons were integrated and, and generating a lot of traffic and there were no more competitors to Facebook, Facebook said, oh, guess what? We are going to use these buttons to gather data from your readers and use that for targeted advertising. So they've done that kind of bait and switch before in changing the terms and conditions. So anything they say now, you know, it, it's hard to figure this out because you know you're looking at it. You're trying to figure out what this thing is going to be, and it's hard to do that when, you know, you have to kind of grab at something, and that all we know is what they're saying. But it's just important to recognize that they have a track record of changing the terms and conditions that they promise initially, and and this is targeted at business. It's not like oh they're spying on me. It's it's like they're changing it for their business partners for millions of businesses across the economy or hundreds of thousands or something like that. Yeah, I think the comparison there is AWS, right? The way that AWS is, has a whole range of businesses that are competitors to Amazon providing those cloud services and are just straight up monitoring those cloud servers and said, we never promised we wouldn't. Um, and, you know, as Facebook might do a I'm not, I'm not sure. I, that might be true, but I'm not, I haven't seen evidence that Am I, Amazon's doing that. Well, I've heard, I, I've seen with the, with the cloud services that there that, that unless you specifically opt out, their cloud data is available to be analyzed by uh, by Amazon services. Yeah, no, I'm I'm, yeah. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just yeah, saying yeah, that like I don't want to. I think that's a compare. I was agreeing with you saying the other thing is I think the privacy question. I agree with Matt. When it comes to corporations, it's about the business to business layer. When it comes to the government side, though, th your payment system is is your permission to access things. Right, your car turns on and off. Your house rent gets paid. Your front door gets locked automatically by some smart locking system if you don't pay your rent or if you get a bad credit score or political score or whatever else it might be. So the, the privacy issue to me is also about there are really, really important design questions right now being made in this generation for digital financial privacy in public money. And if Facebook gets its charter that gets written by 100 companies with no input from any entity that actually has people voting one person, one vote, those questions are going to be primarily answered by Facebook and it's going to have a first mover advantage and any public conversation around the world at the political level is going to be on the back foot and it's going to be in response to the terms of the conversation set by Facebook. Um, we're, we're over time, so I think we should probably wrap up. I'm going to send out the open markets report to everybody who RSVP'd. Um, and yeah, feel free to follow up with me about that and I can direct you to these guys.